Take your Bibles and ch- turn with me again to Romans chapter 1. And that was not an error in our responsive reading this morning, of reading 1, 1 through 7 again. Just thought it good to keep that before us as we move, especially through this introductory material in the book of, of Romans. It's amazing how we really haven't gotten past Paul saying hello. And, uh, and he's already laying out some pretty, pretty heavy theology, some pretty heavy truth about God and his grace and his work. And uh, I can't wait to get into the latter part of this chapter and then 2, 3, 4 and beyond because that's where he really starts unfolding. But he's unfolding a lot for us here. I want to read for you this morning, again, starting, I'm going to start in verse 7, which we ended with last week, and go down through verse 15. So hear the word of the Lord from Romans as we read this this morning. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for for all of you because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow, by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far I have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation. The word there could also be translated, I am a debtor. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. The Apostle Paul, in in writing those words, continuing to, in his introduction, make several things very clear. We've kind of looked at them a little bit, but I want you to remember them clearly. First of all, he makes clear that, that those who are in the church at Rome are loved by God. And he said, I-, I want you to know you are his children. I want you to know that, that you are you in Rome who are loved by God. That is a, a very good description of who we are as believers. We are those who are loved by God with a fatherly love and a genuine love that comes only from him. But, but secondly, he says, they are, they are called by God. They are, they are called out. Remind what Jesus said in John's gospel when he said, no one can come to the Father Uh, No one can come to me unless the Father draws him, brings him, uh, pulls him, if you will, by his Holy Spirit. He said, you are called to be saints. So he talks about being loved by God and part of God's family. He talks about being called by God and a work of the Holy Spirit. And, And then he talks about how they are called to be saints. That is, they're called to holiness. They're called by the Holy Spirit to be changed and shaped and formed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. So in those first verses, Paul says, I want you to understand what the Christian life is. I want you to understand it's not something you just pick up one day and say, I think I'll do this for a while, or that you say, oh, well, I I think I'll try this out and see if it works, or or I think of my own initiative, I'll try to be something that, uh, that I'm really not. No, Paul says, I want you to understand, if you are a part of the church, as those who are in Rome were a part of the church, then you are loved by God, you are called by God, and you're called to be saints. You're called for sanctification. You're called for a changed life. Paul says, I want you to know that. I want you to know that your faith is what energizes that. I want you to know that your trust in Christ and Christ alone that brings about the visibleness of that reality in every person's life. Let's pray together, could we? Oh Lord, we ask you today, as a church that knows that we are loved and called to be saints, Lord, we ask you today to visit your church with authentic faith. 
a, a conspicuous and, and influential faith in our lives. Lord, as Grace Baptist Church, make us famous not for having big organizations or, 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 or who we are, but for demonstrating a big faith in this community and in this world. Make us into a church that's worth talking about. Oh, oh God, talking about for your glory's sake. And Lord, for your glory's sake, empower your church with a convincing witness today. And for ourselves, dear Lord, let us be faithful in the work of intercession, as you're going to teach us about in just a moment. Unknown to the public eye, even in the closet, like Jesus talked about in, in Matthew chapter 7, 6. But Father, vital to all true ministry. Let us, Lord, never lose our quietness before you. As the psalmist said, for us to be still and know that you are God. Lord, never let us lose our quietness before you. Let us never become weary in prayer. Lord, keep alive in our weak heart a jealous love for your church and for your cause. A confident expectation, Lord, of answers to our prayers as we plead that your kingdom advance in the world through the renewal of your church today. It's in the holy name of Christ Jesus that we pray. Amen and amen. Paul begins this section by talking about who they are, which we've already alluded to. And, and then he talks about this, this common greeting that he has in most all of his letters. And you know that all of his letters, he, he opens with a, with a glorious greeting about what God's doing in their presence and what, how he's thankful for what God's doing, except for one. And, and you should know what that one is if you're in our adult Sunday school, because the only church where he doesn't open with that kind of greeting, that kind of positive prayer of, of expectation, is, is to the church at Galatia, the Galatian Christians where they have begun to go with the Judaizers and begun to fall back on the law rather than trusting in Christ. And he says to them, he's praying for them, all right, but he says to them, I am shocked at how quickly you're turning away from the grace that has been given you in Christ Jesus. But in all his others, like here in Rome, he says, listen, I'm so grateful for what God is doing. I'm so happy that God is at work in your life. And he says, it's, it's grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a real sense in which that phrase sums up the entirety of this gospel. We know that those first seven verses that we've talked about the last two weeks talk about the gospel of God and it being of God and about Christ and for the nations and, and right on through. But in that verse right there, that phrase right there, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, it, it epitomizes what Paul is wanting to say to that church at Rome. He starts out by talking about grace. This book is going to emphasize the freeness of God's justification of sinners on the basis of God's grace. We talked about how God is the theme of this book, God is the subject of this book, but sub-subject to that is the fact of God's glorious grace. It's God pouring out His grace on people who do not deserve it. It's God doing things in men and women's lives who deserve just the opposite of what He's given them. And so the church at Rome, He says, grace to you from our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then He says, peace. It's the word shalom in the, in the Hebrew, and, and that they would have, the, the Jewish Christians that had, had migrated there to, to Rome would have understood that very clearly when he says, and, and peace to you from the Lord Jesus Christ. And this book is not only going to be about God's grace, but it's also going to be about God's reconciling peace, reconciling Jews and Gentiles into the body of Christ. He's going to talk about how God has come to give grace through Christ, and God has come to give reconciling peace through Christ and in Christ, and that's the essence of the gospel message that he wants us to understand. He calls them beloved. He calls them saints. He says they're called, and all of those are New Testament words that were used to describe Israel. 
They were the beloved of God. They were the called of God. They were the, the saints of God. They were the chosen of God. And now Paul, I think, is conspicuously using those same words to talk about the church there in Rome because he's showing deliberately that all believers in Christ are a part of God's people now. Whether they're Jew or Gentile, they now belong to the covenant people of God. That's a glorious truth. That is something that ought to strike us immediately with a, with a joy in our heart if we are in Christ. It ought to cause us to think greatly about what God has done and is doing and is going to continue doing in our lives. So, so, so Paul starts that way. And, and then in verse eight he starts with prayer he says i want you to know that i thank my god through jesus christ for all of you why do i thank god for you i, I thank you I, I thank god for you because your faith that god has placed in your life that god has given you to believe in him I, i'm thankful to god that your faith is proclaimed throughout the whole world now, now i'm going to be honest with you i think paul is using a little bit of hyperbole there and talking about their faith being recognized throughout the whole world, I, uh, we understand the world now is a much bigger place than Paul did. And I don't think Paul is saying here that, that okay, it, it's already been proclaimed. The faith of the Romans has already been heard about in this place that will one day be called Somerset, Kentucky. Not at all. But what he's saying is in everywhere that, that people have gone, everywhere that I've gone and heard, in, in the world in which I live, I want you to understand, I, I just hear about and rejoice in that your faith is being proclaimed. You see, Rome was the center of the world. Rome was the capital of everything in that day. And so to, to be out in the outer lands or the hinterlands or away from the cities, and to have people say, you know, in Rome there's a church that's growing and maturing. In Rome there's a church that's believing in Christ and believing God for their security and for their salvation. Even though the government's against them, even though there is no freedom of religion, there is no liberty for religion. It's all caught up in, 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 in Caesar worship and in paganism. And yet in that town, there is, in that city, there are these people in the church at Rome who are trusting God, believing God. Their faith is strong in God and in Jesus Christ. And, and Paul says, I thank God for that. Because your testimony is stretching out. That's why I prayed earlier. I, I pray that that would be how we would be known as Grace Baptist Church. Not as a church because of numbers, not as a church because of programs or organization, not even as a church because of the pastors on the staff, but as a church whose faith is strong, a church who is believing God in the midst of a pagan culture, a church that is trusting God even though the tides of cultural approval are turning against it. But Grace Baptist Church is a church that is trusting in Him. And he says, I, I, I haven't stopped praying for you. God is my witness whom I, 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 I serve in my spirit or with my spirit in the gospel of Son that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I might be able to come there and minister among you. Paul says, you need to know that I've heard about your faith and I rejoice in that and I thank God for that. But I want you to know that I don't stop praying without ceasing i'm praying for you that god will strengthen you that god will use you and that beyond rome and throughout the world that that it will continue to be said that you are a people who are trusting god and walking in god walking with god in fellowship and in relationship in, in every sort of way he prays for them that'll be an example to us that we're to pray for one another Pray for one another. Each week in our, in our order of worship, if you, if you look there on, on the, in the middle section under the prayer focus, you know, there's, there's, there's always prayer for the families of our church. This week it's Don and Missy Campbell, Barbara Carlton, uh, Frank, Debbie, Jordan, Ryan, and Catherine uh, Carrington. 
Eddie Tracy and Cassandra and Nicholas Cassida. Those are, those are the ones we're praying for this week, praying through the directory. And, and I think the example of Paul here would be a good example to take those at least on a, a weekly basis, see who is on the list there, and pray for them. Pray for those who make up the body of Christ. And, and pray that God will increase their faith, that God will increase their faithfulness, that God will increase their trust in Him. Pray that God will use them to show forth his gospel in the world in which we live. He says, I I don't cease praying for you, church at Rome. And I've got a feeling he knew some names and he prayed for them by name and he, he thought about them and he prayed for the leadership there because he's never been there. Never been in Rome. Doesn't know anybody personally. But longs to go and minister because they're on his heart through prayer. You know, if you will pray for people within this body, if you will pray for other people within the body that you don't even know, I mean, it's sometimes easy to pray for our friends if we know they're going through a tough time or, or if they're going through a good time. It's easy to pray for those that we love personally as far as a relationship goes. But, but we're told as believers to love one another completely that that'll be the mark that we are his disciples. And so, so we ought to be praying even for those that we don't know within the body names that just are on a page and of course I, as I tell sometimes on Wednesday night pray for those people that are on that list and if you don't know who they are go find them and introduce yourself and, and get to know them because they're your brothers and sisters in Christ so Paul Paul prays for them he rejoices in what God is doing and he tells them I just want to be with you I, I long to be with you I long to be among you that I, I may impart to you some spiritual gift. Now use the word spiritual gift there, charisma top, which is, is or, uh, which, or charisma, which is the idea of a spiritual gift that he talks about to the Ephesians and talks about to the to, to later in this book in the book of Romans even, later in the practical section, talks about in 1 Corinthians. And there he talked about how that the spiritual gifts, the charisma top, are given by God through his Holy Spirit and only he gives gifts. And here he says, I want to come and impart some gift to you. Paul is not claiming to be the Holy Spirit here. Paul is not saying, I've got some kind of special uh, arrangement with God where I can come and give you gifts that I want you to have. No, not at all. As a matter of fact, it's almost like in this letter that Paul catches himself. You notice that? It's almost, almost like he says, oh, wait a minute. That's, that's not exactly what I meant. He says, I want to come and impart some spiritual gift to you to strengthen you. That is, that I may be mutually encur- that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I, you know, I don't want you to, I want to come and encourage you in your walk with Christ. But even more so, the great apostle, the great preacher of the gospel, probably the greatest in all of history, apart from Christ himself, says, I want to be encouraged by you. I want to come and encourage you. That's my spiritual gift to you. I want to to encourage you in your walk. But man, I want to come and be encouraged by you. I want to be able to laugh with you and cry with you. And I want to be able to see what God is doing in your life. And that will be a great encouragement to me also. See, that's the mutuality in in the church. That's what the church is to be all about. It's not about me coming and getting what I want. It's not about me coming and feeling very comfortable and very affirmed and in, in just being here, you know. It's so that we might come and, and you might encourage others and others might encourage you. That, that you might have a ministry in their life and, and conversely they may have a ministry in your life. It, it's, it's a community kind of thing. Remember us talking about that? It's a community relationship. It's not a separatism. It's not a, a lone ranger thing. We're here to share in that together. So Paul says, I want to come and do that. I want to be there. He said, I've tried to do it a lot. He said, I've, I've really tried to come many times. And, and I've, I've been hindered up to this point. Now, his implication is there. He's been hindered not by finance. He's been hindered not by, not by desire. He's been hindered not by the government even. But he's been hindered by God. That for whatever reason, God has left me here in this area around Jerusalem and these other areas of Asia Minor where I've been planting churches. God has chosen to use me there. And so I, I'm happy with that, but I still, I'm still i content to be where God wants me to be, 
even prays according to his will. And that's why I had Pastor Scott read the, the Lord's Prayer this morning. It's just a reminder because Paul, Paul talks about here, if it be God's will, I want to come to you. I've intended to, but I want to come so I can have, reap a harvest there and be involved in the ministry there among the rest of the Gentiles. I, I want to come, but, but God hadn't let me yet. But I'm not giving up. Now we know later that through the book of Acts and through the, the end of this book as he kind of refers to getting ready to go, he, he, he lets it be known that later he'll go to Rome, but he'll go to Rome as a prisoner, not primarily of his own desire other than he wants to be there. But the governments who will take him there as a prisoner in chains, but he's there. And the church can have access to him and he can have access to them and they can minister, they can pray. And he can encourage and he can be encouraged. He said, I've, I've often planned to come, but to this point I've been hindered. I was reading Thomas Brooks, one of the Puritans, about this particular passage this past week, and, and Brooks talked about seeking God's will for ministry. And said, sometimes we as Christians will seek God's will in this way. We'll go up to a door, a, a symbolic door, of where we think God may be directing us to go, and we'll kind of maybe lightly knock on the door, rattle the, the handle just a little bit, and if the door doesn't open, we say, well, that must not be God's will. I'll just go on back. Paul didn't approach it that way. I think Paul was that door pounding on it, beating on it, yelling and trying to get the, get, get the door to open. He was trying to pry it open. He may have even kicked it a few times to try to get there, but he recognized that any door that God closes, man cannot open, what Jesus said in Revelation chapter 3. Every, whatever, whatever door God closes, man can't open. But he wanted it so bad, he didn't give up in his prayers for going to Rome. Our thing is we knock lightly on the door, we rattle the handle, and we say, oh, well, that must not be God's will. I'll go do something else. But, but there's a, a passion and a need that we need to pursue. Always praying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Always praying, God, if that isn't where you want me to go, then show me another direction, show me another ministry, but don't give up on ministry just because the ministry you think maybe you wanted to go through doesn't first and foremost open up. He wanted to be there. He planned to be there, but he just couldn't get there. So then Paul makes three strong personal statements about his anxiousness to get to Rome. He, he, says, he says in verse He says in verse 14, "I am under obligation. I'm a debtor. I'm bound. That there is a debt that I owe that I can only pay in a specific way when I get to you. But until then, it's an obligation, it's a debt to both Greeks and barbarians, to wise and to foolish. And then he says, I'm eager. In verse 15, I'm, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. I'm eager to come and be there and preach and teach. And then we're not going to touch this one this week. We'll get it next week. But in verse 16, he says, I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So he says, I, I'm, I'm debtor. I'm under obligation. I'm, I'm eager. And I'm not ashamed. And so, so understanding that, Paul is giving us a picture of how our mission ought to be as every single believer. We're not an apostle. We're not called to be an apostle. That was a very limited group of people in the early church called to take the gospel out where it had never been before. But we are still called as slaves, as we talked about three weeks ago. We're, we're called as slaves of Christ, servants of Christ. And, and we too are under obligation, as Paul says, he is under obligation. As he says here, I'm a debtor. I am in debt to Greeks. I'm in, I'm in debt to the Gentiles, and I'm in debt to the barbarians. I, I often wondered why he separated those two, Greeks and barbarians. Because to the Jewish people, those are some pretty much synonymous words. Greeks and barbarians just go together. But he says, I want you to, I, I'm, I'm a, I want to go to those who are, who are Gentiles, who, who are you know, living good lives and, and thinking they're okay, and I want to take the gospel to them, and I want to take it to those who are living horrendous lives, who are, who are just showing themselves to be barbaric in every respect. 
I'm under obligation to them. Now, you got to scratch your head and say, how in the world is Paul a debtor or under obligation to people he's never met? You know, there, there's really two ways that you can be a debtor. I, I could come up to you this morning and say, you know, I, I really, really would like to borrow $1,000 from you. And, uh, and I really need it. And, and you being generous as you are and, and just money rolling out your pockets, you would say, well, of course, Bill, I'll be glad to loan you $1,000. And you would loan me that $1,000, and I would go do with it whatever I need to do with it. But at that point, I'm a debtor to you. I, I'm a debtor to you to pay you back what you have loaned me. And, and so we look at Paul here, we say, well, that certainly doesn't fit for Paul's. For Paul's situation, he hadn't gone to Rome and borrowed anything from them. There's a second way you can be a debtor. If Todd were to come to me and, and say, Bill, I've got a I've got $1,000 here that I want June to have. But I don't even know I got it. But I want you, I don't where it came from, I want you to give him this $1,000. Well, all of a sudden, I'd have that $1,000 in my hands that is not mine uh, to possess or to hoard or to spend. It, it's, it's mine. It's in my hands. But it makes me a debtor, not to, not to Todd, but it makes me a debtor to June. Because I have been entrusted with something, with the understanding that I'm going to get that something to the one for whom it is intended. So, so I'm a debtor to June until I take that $1,000 and place it in his hand, and then I'm free from my debt, right? Well, Paul is saying here, I want you to know, I've been given a treasure and he's going to talk about it more in this first chapter of Romans. Later, he's going to say, I've been given a treasure. I've been given the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've been given a treasure of grace in my own life that I am to share, that I am to pass on. And it's that way in which Paul is saying, I'm a debtor to the Greeks, and I'm a debtor to the barbarians. I'm a debtor to those whom God has said to me, go and take it to them and share it with them. Listen, folks, good news is something to be shared. The gospel is something to be shared. It's not something we can sit back and say, well, I'm, I'm saved and satisfied. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to heaven because I've trusted in Jesus. What else do you want? What else is there needed? And Paul would say, here's the only thing. If you've been given the gospel of grace, if you have been touched by the Holy Spirit, your life has been changed, and you now possess the gospel of God's grace, you possess it as a debtor. You can say, yeah, we're a debtor to God. Sure, we're a debtor to Christ for what he did on the cross. Absolutely. But when Jesus, in those words that we were read last week for our scripture reading, when he looked at his disciples and said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth, and I'm authorizing you, I'm commanding you to go into all the world and make disciples of all men everywhere and all women everywhere, teaching them everything that I've taught you, teaching them to observe the things that I've taught you, to have an obedience of faith in their life. I, I command you to go into all the world and take the gospel. That made you a debtor not just to be thankful to God for the, sal for the, the, the gift of salvation he's given you, but it made you a debtor to those whom he is sending you to. He's saying to you and to me, here's the gospel, you've got it, now spread it. Take it to those who need it. Take it to the Greeks, the Gentiles, the barbarians, to the wise and to the foolish, to, to the educated and to the uneducated, to the rich and to the poor. Take it wherever you go and open your mouth and open your heart and share it. He says, listen, I am under obligation. But you know what that does? You know what that did for Paul? He said, I'm a debtor, I'm under obligation. Verse 15, so I am eager. I'm eager. I'm a debtor and I'm eager. I'm a debtor and I'm eager to pay off the debt. I'll never fully pay it off, 
but I'm eager to come to you and preach the gospel. I'm eager to come to you and share the gospel with you who are in Rome. I want to see, I want to see fruit born there. I want to see fruitful ministry. I want to see a harvest there. I want to be involved in your lives, encouraging you and helping you to carry the gospel forward. Wow. You know, that's almost startling to us, isn't it? Isn't that almost, a st- to me, you know, I, it's kind of startling. I'm a debtor to Gentiles and to barbarians, and I'm eager to go preach, eager to go preach in places where the gospel has not been preached. He'll talk about that later in chapter 15 of Romans. We'll talk about that in a few years. I want to give you a little preview. I'm, I'm a debtor. And I've been given it, and I've got to get it out. I'm a debtor. I've got to, I got to share it. I've got, to, I've got to get it to those who it's intended for. I've got to get it out there. And I'm eager to do it. You know why that's startling to us? Because it's kind of the antithesis of what we see in the modern day church among modern day comfortable Christians among what we might call nominal Christianity in America today I don't know anybody anything God saved me I'm a member of the church. That settles it. That's all there is. You know what? Paul would say, has the gospel really gripped your life? Has the gospel of Jesus Christ really gripped your life? Are you just living for your own pleasure and your own comfort in this hedonistic society in which we live in? Are you, are you living more like the world, just saying, I got what I want and that's all that matters? Or are you living as a debtor to Gentiles and Jews and barbarians and educated and uneducated, wise and foolish, rich and poor? Or maybe you're living thinking, well, I'm in my, I'm in my people, you know, I'll, I'll be... I'll be comfortable sharing the gospel with those who are like me a little bit. (laughs) Not with anybody that's different. Paul fully expresses the idea of absolute difference and diversity in this statement. He says, we are debtors. I take it there. I'm a debtor. I'm an obligation by the Spirit of God. And I'm eager to do it. Are you? Am I? Are we? Let's pray. As we pray, I want you to remember what Luther said about this book. Luther said the chief purpose of Romans is to break down, to pluck up, and to destroy all wisdom and righteousness of the flesh. In other words, all the chaff that there is out there. Trusting in ourselves. Feeling righteous in ourselves, self-righteousness. Feeling wise because we're smart. God wants to break it down, pluck it up, and destroy it if you're depending on the flesh. Oh Lord, how trivial are our aspirations and our desires so much of the time. We pursue the amusements and the toys and carnality of this modern world while the higher longings of our soul weaken from neglect. What do we need to remove from our life 
in order to throw ourselves without reserve or our hindrance into the great cause of the gospel. Lord, show us what we need to remove from our life to do that. Lord, this is our brief moment in history. We don't have forever. Now is our time to speak to this generation. Purify our heart, Lord. Energize our desires. Open our eyes. Compel us with our personal responsibility to serve the interest, interest of the gospel to the world today. Lord, let us spend our life for you, disregarding all risk, accepting all consequences. Lord, let the power of the gospel so grip us that we act upon it, come what may. Father, let us recover the power to live and to die for our faith. Father, help us recover the great truth of Paul for me to live and to die is gain. The, the truth that we have been crucified with Christ and we no longer live, but now Christ lives in us. And while we live on in the flesh, we live for the glory of Christ alone. Father, we are debtors. If we don't feel that debt, we may not possess what we are debtors of. Work in us, O Lord. In the holy name of Christ Jesus, we pray. Amen.